What is euthanasia? I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I haven't really looked into it. There was a, a few things that I've looked at, I'm not like 100% on it. Euthanasia is putting someone to sleep, putting them down. It's like, why would I hear that? I think of putting a dog down, actually. That's when I hear that term. No, euthanasia is when they put people to sleep or something like that, right? Animals to sleep. Euthanasia, you mean by yourself or with assistance? I don't think it's the same as like, you know, like the chair and someone gets, you know, I guess that's euthanasia too when you get put down that way, but I think of being put to sleep, you know, as put under slowly. Your circumstances could change over the 10 years where you're not as healthy as you were before, or something else came along that said, well, now we can help you. Uh, euthanasia is assisted suicide in those who have like terminal cancers and it can't be cured. My name is Joe Tok and I'm the executive director of Human Life Alliance. Healthcare is no longer what it used to be. There are dangers you need to be aware of. You may ask, why should I be concerned? We are at a critical time in our history when stealth euthanasia is becoming ever more prevalent and the pressure to legalize physician-assisted suicide is happening globally. In order to make informed decisions, you need the unvarnished truth about this vitally important topic. This video examines stealth euthanasia and assisted suicide from different angles and highlights the testimonies of those who have been most intimately affected. You need to be forewarned and prepared to take control of your health care issues. This information could save your life. So as far as a living will or a durable power of attorney, I would definitely go with the latter. Uh, just because my father recently, I was saying earlier, he just passed away from cancer. And towards the end of it, he was unable to make those kinds of decisions. He wasn't fully aware of what was going on around him. You know, there was times where I walked in and he didn't even recognize me. So, you know, what is he going to do as far as taking care of himself and making those kinds of plans if he's not all there? So we got the power of attorney signed over to us so we can make those decisions as a family. We sat down and we had talks about his care, you know, hospice, selling his house and all that. And I feel like with power of attorney, we were able to make more of a family decision. My name is Julie Grimstad and I've been a volunteer patient advocate for the past 30 years. There are certain medical documents that people should be aware of and they're called advanced directives for healthcare. The first one is something that we refer to often as a living will. You tell in writing what kinds of treatment you would want in certain circumstances. You do this ahead of time. It is not a good thing to say under what circumstances you would rather be dead in a written legal document. For instance, what would it mean to you if in your document you wrote, if I'm ever in an irreversible condition, I would not want to be provided with artificially administered nutrition and hydration or other life-sustaining treatment. It can mean all kinds of treatment. For instance, a ventilator may be something you need only temporarily. In fact, that's the way it's usually used to get a person over the hump when they've had a car accident and maybe their lungs have been damaged. They might put you on a ventilator and put you in an induced coma so that your lungs have a chance to heal. In those circumstances, would you want to refuse a ventilator or life-sustaining treatment because you were in a serious condition that without treatment would result in your death within six months? No. So we don't want to use a living will. The document that you want is called a durable power of attorney for healthcare, a document in which you name someone you trust to make decisions for you in the event you are unable to make decisions for yourself but you don't want to sign the one that you're given in the hospital or the one that's provided in the, in the state law. You want to sign one that's going to protect your life. 
There is one that we recommend. It's called the Protective Medical Decisions Document. And in our informed magazine, we describe what this document is all about. It does not allow your agent to make any decisions that would cause your death. Okay, how does that protect you? Well, obviously, your agent could be pressured by someone else to make these decisions. So it protects you, but it also protects them from being coerced into um, refusing treatment that might be beneficial to you. Another threat we have to be aware of is something called POLST, Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. The POLST doesn't have to be signed by you. In most states, witnesses are not required, nor is notarization. So there's no witness present to know if the facilitator is checking the boxes appropriately or if you've consented to this. It's all the facilitator's word that you um, checked up these boxes. This is a very frightening situation. How can they know for certain that these are your wishes if you haven't signed it if there were no witnesses and it was signed by a hospital employee? One question I'm often asked is, what questions do I ask my doctor? Or how do I know if I can trust my doctor? I suggest that before you sign up with any doctor that you make an appointment with them and interview them. Just talk to them about what his attitude is towards, say, um, providing nutrition and hydration to patients in certain situations, and uh, what his basic ethical philosophy is. Even if you don't agree with him, he might agree to follow your wishes instead of his druthers when you are in a, a touchy situation. I had a little sister. She was six months. She was premature. They said that she wasn't going to survive. She wasn't going to be, you know, and the doctors offered her the paper, offered the paper to my mom saying that she's not going to live, sign the paper, you know, help her die. That's really, it's uncalled for. They get paid to take care of these people. When I was 19 weeks pregnant, I went in for uh, an ultrasound and the doctor found some markers and he said, we think your baby has a condition called trisomy 18. And I had never heard of it before. I asked what it was. And he said, it's similar to Down syndrome, trisomy 21, but more severe. And he said, you need to have an amnio. And I said, well, I don't want to risk hurting Peter. Uh, it doesn't matter to us if he has this or not. And he said, well, you'll have more choices if you find out. And I said, if you mean abortion, we're not going to abort um, our little baby. And he said, well, nobody carries these babies to term, and they don't live beyond two weeks. Well, the pregnancy continued. And then at 33 weeks, I noticed he had slowed down moving in the womb. And so they did an emergency C-section and little Peter was born. He was three pounds, two ounces, just a tiny little guy. They gave him great care up until day two of his life. And at that time, the test came back saying that he did have full trisomy 18. At that point, it was recommended that we stop all treatment and wrap him up in a blanket and hold him as he dies. In the meantime, our daughter had gone on the internet and did some research and she called me at the hospital and she said, Mom, there are kids living with this. She said, there's, there's even some adults living with this. And I said, well, print off the stories and bring them up to the hospital. So the next day when the doctor came in, I had all these stories. And I said to him, why did you lie to me? And he said, well, you know, we have to think about resources. He said, Peter will never contribute to society and he'll be a horrible burden to your family. And we recommend that you just let him go. And I just cried, just cried. We took Peter home and he was very small and we took him into the pediatrician, you know, for checkups uh, quite frequently. And his pediatrician every time would say, you know, Peter's gonna die. He's be prepared, he's gonna die, he's gonna die. And after a few years, I got so tired of hearing that, I asked him, doctor, when are you gonna die? And he said, what? And I said, well, you're so fond of telling me, you know, that Peter's gonna die. I thought maybe you knew, <laughs> you knew when you were gonna die too. And um, he quit saying that after that. <laughs> In reality, Peter was the easiest of all our 11 children. Um, 
I always knew where he was. He never talked back to me. Um, he was just a joy and a great blessing. Unfortunately, the end of Peter's life was much like the beginning of his life. Um, he had gone in to the hospital and they determined he needed to have his appendix removed. Uh, they did the operation and the surgeon came out and said Peter did great, that he got all the infection and that his heart um, was stable. The next day we noticed his abdomen was getting bigger and bigger and we asked the doctor what that could be. He ordered an ultrasound and he did it himself and he said that he saw air. Um, and he also told us that Peter was filled with infection. And we questioned him and said, well, the surgeon said he wasn't, that he got all the infection. A couple hours later, after the ultrasound, Peter died. All the alarms went off and my husband had gone home and he came back and he asked the doctor what happened. And the doctor said, well, it was the infection and his heart just couldn't take it. We knew something was horribly wrong um, with the way Peter died. We decided to get an independent autopsy done. The autopsy doctor cautioned us, saying, you know, in the majority of cases, I find nothing wrong. And we said, we hope that's what you find. Well, she called us back when she was done, and she said, I was shocked by what I found. She said, Peter had almost a liter of blood in his abdomen. Your son bled to death. And I said, are you telling me Peter didn't have to die? And she said, yes, I believe Peter did not have to die. And we were, we were devastated. I think Peter still lives on uh, in the ministry he inspired. And he still lives on in our hearts. Um, we talk about him all the time. My prayer was always that he would die at home surrounded by people he loved, not die in a hospital at the hands of those who never could see the value of his life. But who's to say that even if you're in a vegetative state, that you're not aware of what's going on around you? And I've also heard stories of you know people being in comas who were, were completely aware of everything that was going around them, but they weren't able to speak, they weren't able to move, they weren't able to do anything, and then they you know pulled through years later and they came and told these stories about like I remember this, I remember that, and that makes me really think you know even if you're in a vegetative state, how can you say somebody's brain dead? My heart had stopped. My breathing had stopped. I was, for all intents and purposes, dead unless they could revive me. I could feel pain. They had shocked me to bring me back, restart my heart. Boom, I was back. After that, I was in a coma. And I had awake and asleep times in the coma. Some people, they can still hear and understand things. They are still cognitive while they're in a coma. Other people have no memory of their coma. I'm one of those that I heard things. I could hear and understand what was going on. There was one particular nurse. She would talk to me. She would let me know what she was going to do. Her voice was gentle. And I just, I just thought, this is a wonderful, wonderful nurse. While I was in the coma, I was not breathing on my own initially. I was not able to eat or drink, so I had IVs and I had a nasogastric tube. So they had a respirator, which intubated was, went through my mouth to keep me breathing. And they had a nasogastric tube that gave me nourishment and fluids. Um, and these things sustained me. 
I remember uh, another incident while I was still in a coma. And I heard a male voice. And he must have been a doctor and there must have been a bunch of interns with him or something because he says, ah, oh, this one is a sad case. Young woman, mother of two little children at home. Her husband is being completely unreasonable though. He doesn't, just isn't ready to let go. But so many people could benefit from her organs if he would just let her go. And I thought, you can't have my organs. I need my organs. There was another young man there, another younger voice, and he says, um, Doctor, is it appropriate to talk like this in front of the patient? And he says, hello, I just told you she's brain dead. This doctor diagnoses a patient as brain dead. This doctor sees the same patient and using different criteria says, no, they're not brain dead. They're simply comatose. Um, or they're maybe in a persistent vegetative state, or they have a variety of different diagnoses that they may apply to someone who is incapacitated because of some sort of brain injury or brain activity, um, a decrease in brain activity. Girls, when they get to that stage, they'll go through um, menarche, they'll start having periods, they'll go through puberty. And they'll continue to grow. A woman who's pregnant and is diagnosed brain dead can continue to carry her child and nourish that child and grow the child within her and, to, and give birth to that child. The whole process can still occur. Now, to say that this person is brain dead and yet all of these things are happening in this person, it, it's not possible because these all are neurologically controlled processes. Digestion does not occur without the um, parasympathetic nervous system telling you to digest. Breathing does not occur without the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system controlling those. These are all processes that come from the brain. The true problem with organ donation is that the person is not able to voice their opinion at that time. They're not, if their organs are going to be harvested, they're being harvested from a person who cannot speak up for themselves. And in every other type of surgical procedure, we require informed consent. If I have my durable power of attorney for healthcare, and I have within that document and through my proxy, my power of attorney, I have indicated what I want to happen if this scenario occurs or that scenario occurs. That is in a way informed consent because I am I have made known in advance what I would want if. The problem is only a tiny percentage of people really know what doctors mean when they say brain death. Most people don't realize that that's not true death. The heart is still working the lungs are still working. The persons, um, as long as we nourish them, they'll stay alive, you know. The definition of brain death varies. You know, you ask this expert or that expert and they'll tell you different ideas of what constitutes brain death. So since it's subjective and not objective, it doesn't have an absolute truth can it be trusted at all as a true diagnosis? Somewhere along the line, somebody realized there was, this was a lucrative business, this organ donation and procurement and uh, transplantation. When an organ transplantation takes place, there's a lot more than just the kidney that is the moneymaker. All right, the kidney, yes, the kidney has its price, it has its value. The, there was the cost of procuring the kidney. So there was a whole surgical team that helped get that kidney in the first place, right? And the facility in which that happened. And money is made by every person involved, every entity involved, including the hospital or the facility. In addition to that, when the transplantation occurs, when the organ is now transplanted to the next being, 
There's the transportation of that organ to its designated place. There's money made by the transporters. Then there, the, the new facility where the transplantation occurs, the hospital has to charge its fees, the cost of the operating room, all of the personnel involved, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon. Um, usually there's more than one surgeon in that type of a case. You have each individual person and entity that is not a person, like the corporation. They all get their share. It's mind-blowing the amount of money that can be made from taking one person's life. So whenever you see dollars come involved, somebody along the way is going to want more. If we can justify diagnosing someone with brain death for the purpose of taking their organs, and we make money from that, why can't we justify saving money by diagnosing the person with brain death and then we are not obligated to take care of them anymore? My life was almost cut short. If the doctor had gotten his way, if he had been able to convince my husband that I was never going to recover, and they had harvested my organs and ended my life, I would not have seen my children grow up. I wouldn't know my beautiful grandchildren. I would not have ever become a nurse. I wouldn't have all the people I've cared for. When I'm teaching, every now and then I think of a real life experience that would reinforce the lesson I'm trying to teach. And I'll just say, would you like a story? And every time the kids, they love the stories. <laughs> And they're all true, real life stories that um, illustrate a point that we are trying to teach. Stories are gifts, and I have been given a lifetime of stories that never would have happened had Dr. Anonymous had his way. What's physician-assisted suicide? I only know one word in there, and that's suicide. Other than that, I'm not too sure. <laughs> physician-assisted suicide. Ah, I guess that's right along the lines with, um, you know, euthanasia. But I don't, I don't personally feel like it should be done at all. In 2005, I was diagnosed with glioblastoma multiforme, terminal brain cancer. Prior to being diagnosed, I was perfectly healthy. Um, I was told that I had a sinus infection, and seven days later, I ended up in the emergency room with a baseball-sized mass on my brain. The doctors told me that I had three to 12 months to live and to spend that time with my family and with my friends. I wanted to get that second opinion. I thought that the second opinion would be invaluable, and so I had asked our insurance company at the time, a large group health insurance company. They denied my request. I wasn't about to give up, so I was gonna do whatever it took to go somewhere with the level of expertise that I felt like I needed to get that second opinion. After going to Kansas City, uh, meeting with a neurosurgeon and a neuro-oncologist, I got good news. I found out that it in fact was operable. In the case of a glioblastoma, being operable is, is one of the most important things um, because it's very aggressive. It can double its size in just a matter of 10 days. I explained to the doctors in Kansas City when we got there the first part of December and they said it was operable. We don't have insurance that's covering um, what's happening right now, the MRI, this visit. What I didn't know until that time is that there are actually graceful physicians out there. That neurosurgeon looked at me and he said, don't worry about you know, my part if we need to do the surgery prior to your new insurance. Very gracious you know, physicians, something that I didn't know existed. They're out there, you know, and, and people need to know that. Utilizing the body as much as possible um, with its own defense mechanisms to um, defeat things that are foreign that are not supposed to be there. So I yep. like it. It sounds innovative and I think 
it's something I like to pursue. And if you can create an environment that the tumor doesn't like to grow in. Yeah. Right. When I heard about Brittany Maynard, the 29-year-old who lived on the West Coast, who was diagnosed with the very same thing I was diagnosed with at the exact same age, that she had chosen to have her physician prescribe fatal bottle of pills to assist her in her suicide, I became very frustrated. I've seen many people, including some of Brittany's family members that have held her and her decision as heroic. But I can tell you as a long-term survivor of glioblastoma, the hero comes in choosing to fight to live. It's not easy to make that choice. I believe that it's much easier to maybe make a different decision, but it doesn't make that decision right. And people need to have hope. And I'm living, breathing proof that there is a reason to have hope. There is no doctor in this country that believe that I would live 11 years. Doctors can be wrong. My husband's biggest issue with the choice that Brittany Maynard made is that she called it death with dignity when she chose to take her life. Those of us that choose to fight, there's dignity there. Really, it's not even about that. It's physician-assisted suicide is what it is. How can you possibly say that, you know, choosing to take your own life by using pills that are fatal is dignity? It's really physician-assisted suicide. And I think if we call it anything else but that, we're trying to hide what it truly is. What Miss Maynard decided to do, I believe, was take a shortcut. She could be me 11 years later, but she chose to make a very different decision. Had I chosen physician-assisted suicide 11 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to see our son grow up. He's now halfway through his junior year in high school. I've been able to meet countless people and share a message of hope. We all have a start date, none of us know the end date, but for me, it's about what do you do with the dash? And I think about all the lives, all the people that I've been able to impact that I never would have met had I made the decision to use physician-assisted suicide 11 years ago. People look at me and they would never know that I've gone through what I've gone through. People need to know that statistics are for groups of people, not individuals. Get informed about your diagnosis. Search online, you know, tools that weren't available to me as much 11 years ago, because there are long-term survivors. There are people out there um, that are diagnosed that, again, have made it have done well, but many doctors won't tell you that, either because A, they don't know, or B, they don't think you're gonna be that person. Everything I've been through in 11 years is worth it. Sharing my story is worth it. If it means that one person, one person's heart and mind is changed, and it means they don't make the decision to give up. What are your thoughts about doctors giving medication to help people kill themselves, essentially? Doctors doing that for people? Uh, yeah, I'm not okay with that at all. Physician assistant suicide is just a pretty title to me. So, but you're really killing folks. My name is Mark Pickup. I am married to wife, Larie. We've been married for 43 years. We have two adult children and five soon to be six grandchildren. I was athletic and able-bodied. I had an upwardly mobile career. I was always very successful at what I tried to do. Um, extremely uh, arrogant man and uh, just thought the world was my oyster. I woke up one morning and I was numb from the waist down. I was laying on the gurney and he was doing his paperwork and I said, what do you think it is? And just as casual as you please. He closed up the file, he said, well, I'm pretty sure it's MS and he walked out of the, out of the examining room. 
My grief was so profound and unimaginable, my sorrow was so sharp, my heartache was so deep, that my judgment became clouded. If assisted suicide had been available during the mid-1980s, if there had been Jack Kevorkian around back then, and if I had not been surrounded by the love of God and the love of my wife and family, I might have opted for assisted suicide. So here I was, 30 years old, diagnosed with MS. My area of work with the Canadian Civil Service was in the area of helping people with disabilities get employment. <laughs> And yet it was my own disability that nailed me in the end. Um, I found, I just wasn't able to meet the rigors of, of my, uh, my job. And so at the age of 38, I was put out to pasture on a, on a disability pension. And I can remember praying, I, I said, God, why this? And with my hand on the Bible, I could swear. It wasn't audible, but it was as though it was audible. The message came through, you are mine. And I can remember thinking, what kind of an answer is that? I didn't even ask that question. But what I think he was trying, what God was trying to illustrate to me was that nothing slips by his attention. Everything happens for a reason. Throughout 30 years of MS, I, I have observed grief both my own and other people's. But there was a parallel grief journey that was happening with my family, particularly my wife. You must remember that she married a healthy man. She married an able-bodied man. She married someone who was so active. And now before her eyes, this man was changing. He was becoming someone different. That he was gone as surely as if I had died. She had to watch it all. And I can remember there were times when we would be so frightened that all we could do was lay in bed and hold each other. That was it. Um, and pray. People need the freedom to grieve, to cry out, to say the most outrageous things and not be held to a death wish that they might have sought when they were at their lowest point. They need someone who will hold up their natural human dignity even when they've lost sight of it. That is where a sense of community can become from the ashes up into something vibrant and new. Suicide, whether it's assisted or not, never affects just the individual. It never does. If I choose assisted suicide, it will affect my wife, my children, my grandchildren. It'll affect my doctor because I'll ask her to stop being my healer and become my executioner. It will affect my community and my nation by helping to entrench the notion there is such a thing as a life that's unworthy to be lived. I don't have a right to do that to people. What I do have a right to is good, state-of-the-art palliative care. No matter how sick I become, I still have a responsibility to the common good of society. Dear Dr. B, I can hardly bring myself to write these words, but a dark reality requires it. I'm referring to legalized assisted suicide. Should I ever request assisted suicide, I want you to refuse to help me. On this point, I am emphatic. Presume that I am speaking out of depression or that multiple sclerosis has begun to affect my mental state. I would not make such a request in my right mind. If, in your judgment, I am suffering from depression, please get me the counseling I need. Protect me from myself or others who would take my life before my natural death. I have such a deep respect for you and for the proper application of your profession. In its Hippocratic tradition, I would not ask you to stop being my healer and become my killer unless my mental state and faculties were impaired by depression or disease. Sincerely, Mark Davis Pickup.
When a person gets a diagnosis of life-threatening issue, suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. You know, there's so many other better treatments in addressing a person's psychological, relational, and spiritual spheres of who they are, and we really need to bring this expertise in spirit, mind, body, or holistic medicine to really help bring true compassion to this person's situation and really walk, walk in this difficult time with them through the adversity. To me, when a person is asking for PAS or considering physician-assisted suicide, they want to know that they're still valuable, that their life still has meaning and purpose. And so 96% of suicide attempts actually end in the person living, but they're so happy that their suicide attempt didn't work, and now they have purpose, they have meaning, and they can connect with God, with their loved ones, with their spouse and family in ways that are enriching and fulfilling. As a psychiatrist, I'm opposed to physician-assisted suicide. There's a lot of better ways to manage those situations when we bring expert care, especially psychiatric care, and true compassion into the situation. And so our science is limited in being able to help physical illness and disability at times, but we powerfully are able to help those that struggle with psychological and spiritual issues. And so the answer to somebody's struggles towards those those difficult adverse seasons of life towards the end of life, it's to really bring true compassion. And true compassion is when we come alongside and we give that person connection, value, purpose, and say, hey, you matter to us. So being able to sit down with them and do talk therapy and discuss some psychological, emotional, and spiritual aspects of what they're thinking and how they're processing life in this particular situation, but also possibly medications and look at antidepressants, or anxiety medications, and certainly we want to try to treat the medical issue that they have because that medical issue might compromise their nutrition or their sleep or their overall strength and energy level to be able to look at life clearly to be able to navigate this new season of life that they find themselves in. When caring becomes killing, how can anybody trust their doctor or psychiatrist? We need patients to be able to be open and honest and we need to be able to have confidentiality and not share their information with other people. And so if we went to physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia today, it would be like going back to the dark ages of 2,500 years ago when this was happening. It's been tried, society's been there, and has said that's not the way we want to go. That's detrimental to people, detrimental to healthcare and the healthcare system, and they vetoed it, and we need to do the same today. Medical advancements that happened, cancers that were untreatable 10 years ago, now that are treatable and that are cured. But when we get a diagnosis like this, and we hear death as part of it, people get afraid and they start to, their mind just jumps to the worst case scenarios of what could happen, the loss of autonomy, the loss of control, debilitating your family and sucking the energy and hope out of them. Healthcare professionals are that last voice for those people that just don't have a voice, whether they be the unborn child, a demented patient, somebody in a coma or stroke or temporarily incapacitated. The Euthanasia Society started in 1938 and progressed over the years with 12 name changes from Final Exit, Hemlock Society, and now Compassion and Choices. They introduced the living will as a means to be able to allow the state to execute people. Their real agenda is to try to get voluntary and involuntary euthanasia passed. And as we give people the message, especially your young people, that society, that the authority feels that life isn't valuable anymore. There's no meaning, there's no purpose to life. Whether it's killing somebody with euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide, we're gonna see devaluing of human life in forms of poor self-esteem, depression, anxiety, self-harm, cutting, bullying. When we start to treat people, look at ourselves and others as commodities or objects, it really demoralizes people and really impairs our society in profound ways. We need to value human life. Your own life and the human life of others is so important. And so as we look at suffering, as we look at people's struggle, we need to be able to really look at that, how do we address these things from a bio, psycho, spiritual approach, a really holistic approach where we look at the whole person and address their psychological, emotional, and spiritual spheres of who they are. These insidious programs of physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia are compromising that doctor-patient relationship. And you want a healthcare worker that is on your side, that's going to fight for you when the chips are down. So go to bat for your healthcare worker and look to protect them when these kind of legislation and laws 
come for your vote. What is hospice today? It can be provided in your home, it can be provided in a nursing home, it can be provided in a hospice facility. There are many different ways that hospice care can be provided to you or your loved one. So you would think that an industry that focuses on helping the family would be an industry that you could rely on and trust. But unfortunately, things have changed since that beginning. These are the things that we have to be careful of. Is the hospice nonprofit or for-profit? Most hospices caught for insurance fraud are for-profit hospices. Find out if they've ever been convicted of fraud, which means that they were charging for services that they did not provide. This not only is fraudulent, of course, but this means that your loved one is not getting any of those services. And also, many for-profits are governed by shareholders concerned about returns on their investments. As a result, money is often allocated away from the patient to increase profit. If the hospice employs marketers, this is often an indication that they are more interested in keeping money in the bank than in providing services to patients. If you're asking them about different services and they repeatedly say, no, we don't provide this, we don't provide that, um, is most likely cutting costs at the bedside. Another question you'll want to ask is what type of services are provided? How often will each of these services be provided? Get these details in writing. Will these services be provided by the same individual throughout the course of your care? Is that hospice going to administer, in this case, medication directly, or are they simply leaving orders for someone else to administer that medication who may not understand the way it's supposed to be administered? It can result in death of the patient. One of the hospices that we dealt with stated clearly that everyone who comes in is immediately put on a regimen of morphine and Ativan. Everyone, regardless of the situation. Be very careful of this. You want your loved one to be treated for whatever he or she is suffering from, not terminally sedated, not having their food and water removed, at which point they will die of dehydration and starvation rather than the disease or the illness that they were being treated for. The person that I may feel comfortable communicating with may be someone that you may not feel comfortable communicating with at all. So keep in mind, if it's not you, if it's your loved one, how do they communicate? Do they like someone who sort of hovers? Do they like someone who is very um, comforting and speaking with them? And so try to pick people who will put your loved one at ease. One of the most common calls that we receive at Human Life Alliance are from people whose loved one has gone into hospice. They have been diagnosed with perhaps up to six months to live. They are alert, they are communicative, they are able to eat and drink, feed themselves, and within 24 hours, all of this is gone. They are comatose. They are not responding, they are not communicating, and food and water has been removed. Why would this happen? The thing to remember is that with Medicare, in the last seven days of a person's life, that rate of pay increases. It's far more profitable for the hospice, and it frees their staff. There's far less care for the patient. They profit both ways. When death is imminent, and we're talking about hours or days, not weeks or months, 
there are times where a person needs to have their medication increased in order to control that pain. That's not done to hasten death. In this case, there truly is a need for higher doses of medication to keep that person comfortable. So one of the most important things I can say to you is be there whenever you can. You need to observe the care. You need to ask questions. It's just human nature that staff will typically treat your loved one differently if they know the family is very involved. At what point, if you're in the hospital, should you be refused treatment and care? Never. People are not money-making machines. It is inhumane to make money from someone who is sick and dying and needs care. Nutrition and hydration is another important thing that we need to touch on. And the reason that it's important is because that is the way that many people are being killed, literally killed, in healthcare situations today. Their food and water is being taken away, they're being sedated or given morphine to cover up to mask the pain that it causes. So you need to be aware of when it is acceptable, morally right, to take away food and fluids. Ella had a nothing by mouth order put on the end of her bed. Ella's daughter had come in from the East Coast and told the nurses that her mother wouldn't want to go to a nursing home. Her mother had a broken hip. So the nurses, without a doctor's order, put a nothing by mouth order on the mother's bed at the daughter's request. For six days, Ella cried for water, according to the roommate, and nobody gave her water because she had this NPO, or this nothing by mouth order, on the end of her bed. They assumed that she was getting ready for surgery or whatever, but nobody investigated. Ella eventually died of dehydration in a hospital in Minneapolis without any food and water for six days. That really woke me up. How could something like this happen in a hospital in the United States? It sounded like Nazi Germany or something. It didn't sound like something that would happen here. But it was true. All of this was true and nothing happened to the hospital. We have to look at what is actually happening. If we take away food and fluids from this person, what will the result be? If the result will be that they die from dehydration and starvation rather than their underlying condition, it's the wrong thing to do. I want people to know that healthcare has become a threat to their lives in many instances. And I'm not saying we can't trust some doctors and some hospitals and some hospices and some palliative care specialists. What I'm saying is that overall medical ethics have changed. They've changed from a sanctity of life ethic to a quality of life ethic. Physician-assisted suicide is dangerous, but one of the dangerous elements of it is when the law is put into effect, they have these safeguards. So one of the primary safeguards is the definition of terminal illness. Terminal illness used to mean that somebody that was given a diagnosis that was gonna end in death pretty soon. Now that's been expanded to be somebody that if they didn't get treatment, would they die? 15-year-old who's healthy but has diabetes, that could live 40, 50 years getting their insulin every day. Now that is considered a terminal illness because if they didn't get their insulin, they would die in a few days. So the expansion of the term terminal to go from somebody that just had maybe a few months to live to somebody who could live a nice full life for 40 years, that's a safeguard that's not being observed very well now. When the doctor does an evaluation, sees if the patient meets the criteria according to the law, prescribes the medication, and the person commits suicide, the reporting by the physician of all that is voluntary. So a lot of times it's not even reported. There is no documentation. So as we go back to explore, is this safe? Is it being handled properly? The reason why we talk about physician-assisted suicide being such a slippery slope is because of these safeguards and not knowing are these safeguards 
being maintained or not. We know that some of them have been botched, where the person didn't swallow enough medication and they had to be rushed you know, to the emergency room in an ambulance. And whenever the person dies, as the physician, I'm asked to forge a death certificate, and instead of putting assisted suicide or suicide as the cause of death, I need to put the what was the medical illness that they actually were suffering from, cancer, diabetes, whatever thing. So, Whenever that diagnosis is on there, and it's not suicide, the police can investigate. So there's been situations where there's been conflict in a family, that one son felt that it wasn't suicide, that maybe the brother might have killed their parent. The other one says, no, dad took the medications on their own. Police can't investigate because the death certificate says they died of cancer, not because of suicide or attempted murder. Another safeguard is intractable suffering put in there for the idea of pain that was intolerable. But now intractable suffering could mean psychological, emotional, or relational pain as determined by either the patient or the physician evaluating. Another safeguard is competence of the patient. So as we look, if a person was having a struggle psychologically, they should go to a psychiatrist for an evaluation. From my point of view, anybody who gets this life-threatening diagnosis and is thinking about suicide already shows us that there's some psychological struggle that's significant enough for them to think of suicide that should mandate a psychiatric evaluation. But only 3% in Oregon in the last report were referred to a psychiatrist for evaluation. Another key parameter is how long you have to wait from presenting to the doctor the first time to be evaluated and then presenting the second time to get your prescription. That's only 15 days. That's such a short amount of time to be able to allow a person to clear their head, understand what's going on, sort out their life situation, find other options for fullness and richness in life rather than just 15 days later, here's your prescription to kill yourself. After that prescription is given, there's no follow-up for that person. So that person might become incompetent uh, because of their illness, but nobody's evaluating afterwards. They just have this deadly concoction of an overdose that they're given, and then that's it. There's no witness there at the death. There's no professional, there's no family member mandated to be there. So the only objective witness is killed in the process. So we don't really know what happens in most of these cases. So these safeguards, even though they're put in place technically to not allow the slippery slope of having more people included in this um, detrimental and deadly process, because the safeguards aren't mandated and they're very loose and there's voluntary reporting, we don't know if those safeguards or ever being observed. The slippery slope of physician-assisted suicide is so insidious and moves a little bit by little bit each time. And as we talked about the safeguards being relaxed, more people just fall under the umbrella of who's gonna die next in this process, who they're gonna include. In the Netherlands and Belgium, if a child is less than one years old and has a birth defect, they're allowed to euthanize that child. 20% of the ones that were recently euthanized in this past year were euthanized without parental consent. Parents didn't even have a say because the physicians thought that it would be too traumatic for the parents to have to make that decision. So they took that out of their hands. Could you imagine coming in, your baby is having a physical struggle in the hospital one day, you go home overnight and you come in the next day and your baby is dead because it was euthanized and you didn't even have an option or consent in the process. If you're still uncertain about physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia, what society would you like to live in? A society that protected life, that came alongside and connected, loved a person and cared for them? Or is a society that killed a person that didn't value human life and exterminated them quickly? As a psychiatrist, I would implore you to be cautious and extend care and love because that's what you would want in these kind of situations. Often when these decisions need to be made, the individual and or the family is sleep deprived, emotional, high stress. We urge you at these times to seek counseling, to seek help. Try not to give in to those who are trying to rush you, who are trying to push you into making a decision that you're not comfortable making at that point. If you want someone to talk with, if you want to run situations by us, please feel free to call us with questions or concerns. You 
are fearfully, wonderfully made, and you're here for a reason. You are fearfully, wonderfully made, and I'm for you. These hands will protect you, not hurt or neglect you, and you truly matter. You are fearfully, wonderfully made, and I'm